going to be in Isaiah chapter 53. You have it in your Bible. Uh, many Jewish Bibles, well, they've started putting it back in, but for a long time, um, Isaiah 53 was not included in, uh, in Jewish Bibles. Uh, the Ashkenazi Jews uh, wanted to take it out, the Sephard or they took it out, the Sephardic Jews left it in. You probably don't care who did what, but the fact is that they did uh, because they believed that the Christians had actually planted it in there. It was such a clear presentation of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ 700 years before Christ went to the cross. You know, we're probably all familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls. The first ones were found in uh, 1946, some in 1947. You probably know that uh, Israel um, had their War of Independence. May 14, 1948, they declared independence. And in June of 1948, the Scroll of Isaiah was found. The Dead Sea Scroll of Isaiah was found. Uh, it, really, it speaks to me of just how much God loves Israel and is telling Israel, you're back in the land, now let's, let's pay attention to this. Uh, those of you who've been to Israel, you know you can see the scroll on display at the Shrine of the Book. You know, as you, as you work through, there's only 12 verses in this chapter. Um, you'll probably say 12 verses, and it's going to take you forever to go through it at the rate you're going here. But uh, if, you, if you look at, and, and I know I say this a lot to people who, who want to teach the Bible, but you always look for things like, look for the verbs, look for the pronouns, who's doing what, what's the action, those are really important things to look for. If you look at the pronouns, um, we, us, our, you find 14 times in 12 verses. He, his, him, 54 times in those 12 verses. So who's it about? It's about him, for us, you know. Jesus, you know, I think about this for a moment. Uh, in the upper room, Jesus says to the guys there, uh, actually early on, he said to them, uh, in John, we read that he said, you know, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll also return and receive you so that you may be with me where I am. But they were troubled. Why? Because he kept talking about dying. They didn't get this. Like, what's the dying thing all about? You're the king. You're the Messiah. Why are you talking about this? And of course, you know, we've already seen in some of our study in Luke that as much as he talked about dying, they, it just went right over their heads. They, it just slid, slid right off. They couldn't get it. There was no way they could conceive that he would die. So think about that. When, when Jesus says to them, and you know, really each of, of the Gospels where he talks about the bread and the cup, Matthew, he says, you know, this bread is my body broken for you. This cup is the cup of the new covenant that's in my blood. Every time you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. We think they get that. They don't get that. They don't get that. We struggle to get it, and we know what he did. We know that he went to the cross, and, and that he, he's talking about his body beaten and bruised and nailed to a cross, and his blood that was, was spent out as an atonement for our sin. They didn't know that stuff. I, just So keep that in mind as we walk through this. So often I think, and many of you in here this morning probably feel this way. Jesus is disappointed with me. Jesus is angry with me. Something I'm doing in my life or that I've done in my life, he thinks, eh, you know, a lemon. I got a lemon. You know, a second class Christian. They don't really measure up. I paid for them. Father F. I know they're going to get in eventually. You know, we, we have these ideas of the things that Jesus thinks about us, and it's really not true. As we look at this passage this morning, we're going to see how much he really did do for you, for me. I said chapter 53, but look over in chapter 49 for a minute. Many of us feel this way. Verse 14 now, this is Israel's complaint, but you can put your name in here. Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. I know some of you feel that way this morning. Because it's normal. We each can go through that at times. 
And for those who don't feel that way this morning, you have probably felt that way. And for the few who will say, I don't feel that way and I never have, well, I hope you don't, but you probably will at some point. But look at what he says in response to that. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Is that even possible? And then he says, and even if that were possible, even if that were possible, yet I will not forget you. Why? I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands. It's a picture. It's a, you know, looking forward, of course, to the nail prints in his hand for you and for me. Even if your mom would give, you, give up on you, and some of you probably feel like she did at some point, God never will. He couldn't because he already gave everything for you. He faced the music for us, you could say. Look at uh, chapter 50. Uh, there's so much, but I'm just trying to skip around. I guess you'd say cherry pick. But anyhow, he says, verse 6 of chapter 50, I gave my back to the strikers or to the smiters, those who struck me, it says. Think of, think of what he did. When it says, I gave my back, he's talking about being, being strapped down over the beam and probably having two Two, the two flagellums with these, these long uh, uh, leather straps with lead weights. If you like deep sea fishing, get a picture of that kind of a weight with glass, shells, metal, things like that. So the idea of, uh, what would we say, tenderizing, tenderizing the meat? Is that the way of putting it? Of beating and beating against the flesh and then tearing it apart. Usually by the time the tenth strike came then all the flesh was being torn back. Some of you are saying, oh, is he going to do this this morning? I haven't really had breakfast yet, and we're going to go to brunch, and I don't want to get an upset stomach. Think of what he did for you. I gave my back to them for you. That's what he's saying. By the time they were finished with the 40 lashes, uh, his, some of his ribs would have already been pulled out. Organs would have been exposed. We don't like to think of that. We have a, a TV a movie uh, vision of Jesus, a little trickle of blood coming down the side. He didn't look like that. I gave my back to the strikers, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. Those of you uh, who have beards, you appreciate this, to think of that, the anger of man to just grab him and pull his face apart by his beard. I didn't hide my face from the shame and from the, smitting, the, uh, the spitting. He faced the music. He really did. You think about it, it, he got to the point where he didn't even bear the image of a man. He didn't look human is basically what it's saying. He's not worse than any man has ever been, no. But you think of Mary at the tomb when she meets with him. There's a reason why she didn't recognize him. There's a reason why the, the disciples on the way to Emmaus, remember, they were disciples. They're not the apostles, but they're disciples. They were followers, close followers of Jesus, and still they didn't recognize him. They walked seven miles with him, and still they didn't recognize him. Why? So a lot of us want to say, well, just, God just hid that from them. Okay. No, the reality is they couldn't recognize him. He was just, he looked so different from what they had known before. We're the opposite of that. We have this other view. We have, we have the nice you know, blonde hair, blue-eyed Jesus. They don't even look Middle Eastern. But, you know, he said, we, we saw this in, uh, uh, early on in Luke chapter 9 a few weeks ago or a month ago, whatever that was. Uh, he set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. It says here in verse 7 that he, uh, he said, I've set my face like a flint. For what? To do what? I've set my face like a flint to go pay the price for you. Each of us was going to hell. We don't like to think about that. The stuff you talk about in church, but we don't think about that outside. Everybody in the world is destined there. It's not my opinion, it's what the Bible says. It's not just a Christian perspective, it's what the Bible says. In fact, everybody knows that that's what everybody deserves. We just don't like to personalize it that much. We like to dress it up and we like to think of people we love as, well, they're really basically pretty nice people after all. No. We all deserve one thing, and that's God's wrath. And so it says, chapter 52, we're getting there. Verse 14. 
Ashley, start verse 13 of chapter 52. Behold, my servant, now he's talking about his servant. My servant shall, be, shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted. He shall be extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. And so he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Here he is. He asked this question then. You know, we can sit here and we can hear these things. You can read it. But the question that Isaiah asks is the question that each one of us has to answer. He says here, verse 1, who has believed our report? Do you believe it? No, no, it's right to believe it in church. But I mean, and, and, but do you believe it? Well, of course I believe it. I'm a Christian. No, but do you know it, believe it? Do you know it? Like when you think of Jesus, who are you thinking about? You're thinking about the suntan carpenter, walks around the Sea of Galilee, pats the little kids on the head, sits them on his lap. That's a nice picture of Jesus, and it's not wrong. But to think of the one who came and ransomed you. You were destined for hell, and there was not a thing you could do about it. It wasn't because of your sins, plural. It wasn't because of our actions, plural, or even singular. It was because we were born as sinners. It was a genetic defect, if you want to put it that way, that our ancestor Adam caused for us, and we would have done the same thing that Adam did. There was not a thing we could do about it, and God rescued us. Who has believed our report? Do you believe it is the question. Do you believe that? To have, who's believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him as a tender plant tender the idea of a tender plant one that's uh, it's exotic it's 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 outside of its natural setting it's going to be difficult for it to grow up he comes from heaven is the point and takes on the form of a man he's in a setting he's not he's never been in he's been in heaven all of his life and now he takes on the full humanity He grew up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He had no form nor comeliness. The idea of comeliness is an interesting word, but like majesty. Now he's writing to a Jewish audience, but it's important for us too to think of it this way. Because when we think of Messiah, we think, oh, the great king. Yes, he is. But when you think of the great thing, you think king, you think of what? You think of majesty. But he had no form or majesty that we would desire him. I mean, think about it. Majesty. He appears before Pilate. He says, are you the king of the Jews? Like, what's he looking at? He's not seeing a king. Pilate's not thinking of him as a king. You're the king of the Jews? Yeah, he had no form or majesty that we would desire him. He's despised. He's that, oh, excuse me. Uh, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised. He's rejected of men. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I, I don't know what you think when you think that phrase. A man of sorrows. That's one of those well-known Christian phrases. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The idea being a man of sorrows. A man of sorrows. Uh, it means something different for us today. We, we think of sadness. It's like a man of pain all his life. He's known pain. Each of us experiences pain. Some people live in chronic pain. But he's a man of pain. He's fully acquainted with pain. He's a man of pain, a man of sorrows, a man of pain, acquainted with grief, the idea of sufferings. Is we think grief like I'm sad because someone died. Sufferings. No matter how much pain anyone in this room is in or ever has been in. It's not one upsmanship on his part, I don't mean it that way. But there's no comparison to what he's already experienced just in his life before he even goes to the cross. Whatever sufferings any of us in this room experience, and they're all valid, the point is he understands it because he is a man of pain, a man of suffering.
and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. The leadership of Israel despised him, and we didn't esteem him. He's borne our griefs. He's borne our sufferings. He's borne our sorrows, our pains. He's borne all of those, which is, you know, we don't have time for all this but the, uh, this morning, but the idea, he bore all those things, all those sicknesses, all those pains, all those griefs, all those sufferings that we experience, he has borne, not just in his life, but then took them to the cross, is the point. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised or crushed is the word, crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement, the punishment for our peace was upon him or the chastisement that would bring us peace was upon him and by his stripes, the wounds that he bore for us were healed. Our transgressions, our sins, our iniquities, we tend to lump them all together. Sin, you know, we've all sort of talked about this before, the idea of sin being an old, uh, in, old English archery term of missing the mark. You know, you aim at the bullseye and you, you hit the guy standing next to the target. That, that was me in high school with a bow. Um, but uh, we all do that. Something just comes out of our mouth. We weren't even thinking about it. Or, or you know, th that's a sin. It, we weren't planning on it. It just comes out. Transgression, a trespass. The idea of saying, I see the fence, but I'm going anyhow. Right? I'm choosing to go there, even though I know I shouldn't. Iniquity. The best way of translating the Hebrew is that twistedness in us. We've all got it. There's a twisted nature to every single one of us. But he bore all that. He paid for all of that. And by his stripes, we're healed. There's, there is healing there in, in the punishment that he took for us. And this becomes controversial depending upon which side of the church you happen to be on. Some people believe that every single sickness is, is healed by what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. That will be healed in this life. And we know by experience that that doesn't happen all the time. And so we get confused. Well, we ignore the fact that this life is not what it's all about. Ultimately, there's a life ahead of us. And I don't mean in heaven. I mean in the kingdom of God, the forever kingdom that we'll be in, which is very, very tangible. We'll be there. Yes, by his stripes in that regard, we're all going to be healed. Some get healed in this life, but we still die, don't we? Okay, so by his stripes, yes, there is healing. The real issue is our sin. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Of us all. All of us have gone astray. Each of us has turned to do our own thing. To say, yeah, yeah, I know all that stuff. Yeah, 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 I've heard it before, blah, blah, blah. And then we go our own way. And even so, even so, for his enemies as well as his friends, he still offered up his life. That's inconceivable to me. Hey, you're all nice people, but I, you know, that's not my inclination. You know, it's not the inclination of any man or woman in this room. But that's how God loves us. He was willing to do that because ultimately, who nailed him to the cross? Who, who killed Jesus Christ? We say it was the Jews. They, they suffered that for 2,000 years. We say it was the Romans. They were actually the ones who drove the, the nails. No, it was me. I did it. And you did it. We each did it. Because there was a hatred there. And in many ways, for some in this room, it's still that case. It doesn't have to be. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned 
to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. And yet he opened not his mouth. Why? He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Why? I mean, look at the words. He was despised. He was rejected. Sorrow. Suffering. He bore. He carried. He was stricken, smitten, afflicted, crushed, pierced, punished, oppression, judgment, cut off. These are harsh, powerful, hard, violent words. I inflicted it, and he endured it because he loved me anyhow. You inflicted it. And he endured it because he loved you anyhow. We say he was innocent. He went to the cross. He was innocent. He opened not his mouth. I mean, really think about it. Who, beginning with any one of us, who would suffer any kind of punishment? Who would suffer any kind of violence? Who would endure punishment for somebody else when, when we're innocent, who would do that? Who would do that? He opened not his mouth, and yet he goes and he, and, and, and he endures the pain and the full cup of the wrath of God that I deserved, that you deserved, that every person in this world ever deserved. He endured it, and he opened not his mouth. We say that's remarkable, and it is remarkable. I don't mean to take anything away from that. Was he innocent? Well, of course, in one regard he was. But as he took that punishment, the Bible says that he became me on the cross. He became you. Every aspect of my humanity, every aspect of your humanity, every aspect of our sins, of our iniquity, of our transgressions, every bit of that, he, yeah, he bore it. He was that. Paul will say later on that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might receive his righteousness. It's a remarkable, incredible exchange that God has provided for us. And what does he say on the cross? Think about it. He's, he's despised. He's rejected. He cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He actually cries that out because at that point, because he became me, because he became you, separated from his father for all eternity, unity with his father, and suddenly pulled apart because of John Hessler, suddenly pulled apart because of, put your name in there, pulled apart, experiencing the full wrath of God at that moment. He didn't just in one general sense take on sin. He took it very specifically, very personally, very specific in terms of you, in terms of me, and very personal in terms of you, in terms of me, in terms of him. And he did it for me. That's the exchange. And so at the end, John records that he would cry out his last words from the cross were not a whimper. It was a cry of victory. It's finished. Paid in full, literally is what he's saying. The debt that all mankind owed, he paid at that moment. And why? Why would he do this? He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generations? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. For he made his grave with the wicked. There he is crucified between two thieves. Was he crucified on a cross of wood, and yet he made the hill on which it stood. As he's being crucified, as he's suffering all of the wrath that you and I and all humanity deserve. Yet as God, he was holding together even the atoms that made up the nails 
that, that kept him on that cross. It's just, it's, it's so far beyond me. I mean, this is called the Holy of the Holies of the Old Testament, and we're hardly scratching the surface on it. For he made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich in his death. I have to think that Joseph of Arimathea later on, because it was his, it was, it was his tomb where Jesus is buried, that at the end, he has to read this at some point, after this is all over, and to realize, that's me. Have you ever thought about, here's Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, both were members of the Sanhedrin, the high council. They were secret disciples. Think about it. How many of us in this room are secret disciples as far as the world's concerned? As far as our workplace, as far as our families, how many of us are secret disciples? And what did, what did Joseph and, and Nick miss out on during those three and a half years of Jesus' ministry? Just think of the things they could have experienced but they were secret disciples. They held back from knowing those things. But it was, it was Joseph's tomb. So he was buried with the rich in his death. Why? Because he'd done no violence. There was no deceit in his mouth. And yet, amazing. They're all amazing. But yet, verse 10, it pleased the Lord to crush him and to put him to grief. Why did it please the Lord to crush him? and to put him to grief. Why? You have to ask that question. Don't just read some poetic poetry here, poetic prophecy here, or prophetic poetry. But don't just read it, but think about it. What was it? Why did it please the Lord to crush him? Paul says over in Hebrews 12, it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, he endured it, and he despised the shame. He didn't want that. He prayed in the garden, Lord, if there's any other way, take it from me. He despised the shame involved in this, but he did it, why? The joy set before him. What's the joy? That he would be with you forever. That's why he did it, to be with us forever. It pleased the Lord to crush him and to put him to grief. And when, when he makes his soul an offering for sin, he'll see his seed, that's, that's you and me. He'll prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He'll see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. For he'll bear their iniquities. And therefore, the Lord says, I will divide him a portion with the great. And he'll divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. 